We now come to section 3, private equity fund structures and valuation. And these are the subsections, understanding private equity fund structures. So how are the funds structured? What are the risks and costs of investing in private equity? Due diligence investigation by potential investors. This is extremely important. In fact, one common theme across alternative investments is the importance of due diligence. Private equity fund valuation and then evaluating fund performance. I hope you recognize that here our perspective is changing. In section 2, the perspective was that of a private equity fund making investments in portfolio companies. Now the perspective is that of an outside investor making investments in a private equity fund. All right. I have used these terms before, but now I will introduce them formally. General partner versus limited partner. Limited partner is this outside investor who puts money in the private equity fund. The private equity company is run by general partners and then obviously those general partners oversee the fund. Just to emphasize, so this outside investor is the limited partner and the people running the fund are called the general partners. There are two core functions of a private equity firm. One is to raise funds and the other is to manage investments. And the way I have shown these pictures highlight these two core functions. Getting money from the investors or the LPs obviously is important. The private equity fund has its own money. The GPs are also investors, but they need money from LPs or outside investors. So raising money or marketing is one function. And then the other function is what we talked about in section two, which is evaluating these portfolio companies or these potential investments and then putting money in them and then actually helping run and manage these companies. This picture is taken from the curriculum and it is important. So I'll illustrate the main points. This initial phase of marketing, what is happening here is that the private equity fund creates a new fund and starts marketing. So it reaches out to potential investors, the LPs, and tells them about the fund. The prospectus is shared. Maybe they are roadshows. And what investors, potential investors then do is make commitments about how much they will invest. That is also happening over here. Now notice when the LP makes a commitment, that doesn't mean that the LP is actually paying at that time. A given LP might make a commitment that, okay, this is a $125 million fund. I am going to commit 10 million. And often it is large institutional investors that engage in private equity. Given the amount of money that needs to be committed, you won't have small retail investors typically investing in a private equity fund. Then there is this drawdown or investment period. If a given LP has made a commitment of 10 million, at an appropriate time, the private equity fund will draw down from that 10 million. So there might be a particular opportunity. And of the 10 million in year one, the private equity firm draws down 2 million and invests that 2 million. So the 10 million will typically not be drawn down all at once. It will be over a period of time. Then there is a realization of returns and exit. Point being that let's say that 2 million was drawn down and then that was invested somewhere that particular investment was then sold off after four years and the money is returned to the LP. Typically, the life of a fund is 10 years. And I want to draw a distinction between the life of a fund and the life of an investment. A given fund can make several investments. Typically, the life of the overall fund is 10 years, which sometimes can be extended for a year or two. 
then within the context of the life of the fund, several investments are being made. So it is possible that the first set of investments were made and they lasted four to five years. And then another set of investments were made, which also lasted four to five years. So overall, the life of the fund is typically about 10 years. Two points to note over here. The first one is that investors commit a certain amount that is subsequently drawn by the fund. I've already made this point. Another term which you need to understand is something called the J-curve effect. What this means is that in private equity, what investors should keep in mind is that if they put in their money, initially chances are that there's going to be a negative return. And only in the relatively long term will there be positive returns. And the hope is that in the long run, the returns are substantially positive. So substantial returns in the long run. So since negative brings you down a little bit and then high positive returns makes this look like a J. So this is called the J curve effect. So there is a question about what happens at the end of 10 years. So the point being that the private equity firm tries that by the end of 10 years, all the investments are liquidated and the funds are returned. If it turns out that this is not the right time to liquidate, and a little more time is needed, that's where this extension kicks in. The point being that private equity funds do not just go on and on. They have a finite life, roughly 10 to 12 years. This slide shows a laundry list of economic terms. And these are the terms between the LP and the GP. What you are looking at here has been taken directly from the curriculum. What I'll do here is let you pause and read this. But on the next slide, I'll emphasize the terms that I think are most testable. So this is a subset of what you saw on the last slide. Again, context being that these are the economic terms or agreements typically between the limited partners or the outside investors and the general partner. The limited partner will pay a management fee, which represents a percentage of committed capital. And this fee is paid annually to the GP. You can think of this a little bit like a mutual fund. If a mutual fund investor puts money in a mutual fund, then one element of the fee that is paid is the management fee, which is a function of how much has been invested. Now, this part says that the management fee typically represents a percentage of committed capital. Later, we will see an example where the management fee is a function of the actual money that has been contributed. And I hope you recognize the distinction. A given company might say that they are committing 10 million or a given investor might say that he is committing 10 million. But at a particular point in time, he might only have actually contributed 3 million. My point here is that the prospectus will make it clear whether the management fee is a percentage of committed capital or contributed capital. So you need to watch that carefully. Then there is this concept of carried interest, which I think is very testable because there are several examples on this. Carried interest represents the general partner's share of profits generated by a private equity firm. In other words, if you are LPs and you are contributing to a GP and the investments made by the GP give a huge return, there is a substantial profit. There is then going to be some profit sharing where the GP takes some of that profit. The profit that the GP takes is called carried interest in the private equity industry. Hurdle rate. Hurdle rate is the internal rate of return that a private equity fund must achieve before the GP receives any carried interest. Let's say that the GP makes investments and the return is 10%. And this is happening in an economy where the risk-free rate is 10%. Then does it make sense for the GP to claim a percent of the profit? Probably not. So very often there is this agreed upon hurdle rate, which might be say 
only if profits are above 20% will the GP get a share of the profit. Vintage year is the year the private equity fund was launched. Reference to vintage year allows performance comparison of funds of the same stage and industry focus. This is important because if you think about the technology sector and investments in technology companies, if a VC fund was established in 1999, this was just before the technology bubble crashed in 2000. Then clearly the performance of this fund is probably not going to be as good as another fund that was also based on technology investments, but which went from 1990 to 1999. This was a huge boom period for technology. So it doesn't make sense to compare with a fund with a vintage year of 1999. So when you make comparisons, the comparisons should be based on similar vintage years and similar investment focus. The term of the fund is typically 10 years, extendable for shorter periods at times. Now let's look at an example. I want you to pause the video and read this before listening to my remarks. Here, this is just an example that you read. There isn't actually work to be done, but still make sure you understand this because material here is testable. I'll now read this with you and explain the points. Suppose that a LBO, LBO is a leveraged buyout. So a LBO fund has committed capital of 100 million carried interest of 20% and a hurdle rate of 8%. So carried interest 20% means that the GP will get 20% of the profits as long as the return exceeds 8%. The fund called 75% of its commitments from investors at the beginning of year one. So 75 million was called which was invested at the beginning of year one in target company A, where the investment was 40 million and target company B, where the investment was 35 million. Suppose that at the end of year two, a profit of 5 million has been realized by the GP upon exit of the investment in company A. So what has happened here is that a has gone from 40 to 45 and then there is an exit. Investment in company B has remained unchanged. So B is still 35 and there is no exit. Suppose also that the GP is entitled to carried interest on a deal by deal basis, i.e. the IRR used to calculate carried interest is calculated for each investment upon exit. So that means we can now calculate the carried interest for investment A. Does the GP get anything? There is a profit, but did we exceed the hurdle rate of 8%? The answer is that we did not because the annual return was only 6.1%. So for A, the return was 6.1%. The question is, where did this come from? If you look at the text very carefully, when was this investment made? It was made at the start. So if you look at the wording very carefully, at time zero, the LP made an investment of 40. And then at the end of year two, so this is year one, this is year two, the amount returned was 45. If you plug into your calculator minus 40 and then two years later plus 45 and you compute the IRR, what you should get is 6.1 percent. Remember the 8 percent by definition is an annualized rate. So you need to come up with the annual IRR. Next point, corporate governance terms. On the previous slides, we were talking about economic terms between the LP and the GP. Now we are talking about corporate governance terms. 
So these are some important terms that you need to be aware of and they are taken straight from the curriculum. The key man clause says that if there is a certain key person in the private equity fund, so that is the person based on whom you made the investment and that key person leaves, then there need to be certain provisions. So if that key person leaves, then there might be something which says that investments will not be made until another key person joins the firm. So this helps protect the LP. Next point is with regards to disclosure and confidentiality. Since these are private investments, the disclosure requirements are very low. And also if you as an LP have invested, then the GP will generally keep that information confidential. Next point which I think is very testable is a clawback provision. So what happens with the clawback provision? The idea is this. Let's say that you have a deal by deal scenario. So again you have LP and you have a GP. Say that Initially, when the LP contributes money, that money is invested somewhere, let's say project A, which gives a very high return. Will the GP get a share of the profit or carried interest? The answer is yes, the GP will get carried interest. But then let's say that subsequent investments did not do well at all. So here you ended up giving, you being the LP, ended up giving a high amount of carried interest, but then subsequent investments did badly. A clawback provision says that you as the LP can then actually get money back from the GP. Why? Because if you take a longer term perspective, you overpaid over here, you gave a lot of money, but then subsequently there were losses. So clawback means essentially that you can put your money, put your hand into the coffers of the GP and claw back or pull back some of that money. So is the clawback provision good for the GP or the LP? The clawback provision actually is good for the LP. Now this clawback can happen on termination. So if you have a 10 year fund, then at the end of 10 years, you can figure out whether you as the LP need to get some money back or there can be a annual reconciliation. This is also called an annual true up in some of the examples that you will see, which means that at the end of every year, you see whether you as an LP have overpaid and then you get some of that money back. The next important point is with regards to a distribution waterfall, which talks about how the GP gets carried interest. We have already referred to this term, a deal by deal waterfall. This says that for every deal, and I hope you are clear now what a deal means. A deal means that essentially the GP gets some money, makes an investment and then exits that investment. That overall set of transactions is a deal. So every time an investment is made and then the investment is exited, there is a certain profit. A deal by deal setup means that whenever there is a profit, you figure out whether it exceeded a given hurdle rate and then the GP gets his share of the profit on a deal by deal basis. Another scenario is called a total return waterfall, which is the opposite of deal by deal. Within total return, there are two possibilities or two alternatives. Total return waterfall alternative one says that the GP receives carried interest after the entire committed amount is returned. In other words, you as an investor have committed 10 million and only once this money has been called and then invested and then you have returned, you have been returned how much ever money you need to be returned, the carried interest is calculated at the end. So this is called a total return waterfall. Does it make sense to have a clawback provision here? Over here, it doesn't make sense to have a clawback provision because all the calculation of carried interest is actually happening at the end. Total return waterfall alternative two 
is that the GP receives carried interest if the value of the investment portfolio exceeds a threshold over invested capital. So what is the difference between one and two? With one, our calculation is based on the committed amount. With two, our calculation is based on the amount actually invested. And I hope you can connect this with what we talked about earlier and recognize the distinction between the committed amount and the invested amount. And we'll see examples of this. Moving on to some more corporate governance terms, tag along drag along rights. We have talked about this earlier when we talked about aligning of interests. So I'll just read this again from the curriculum. Tag along drag along rights are contractual provisions in share purchase agreements that ensure any potential future acquirer of the company may not acquire control without extending an acquisition offer to all stakeholders including the management of the portfolio companies. So essentially it keeps everyone together. Then these other items that I'll read for you very briefly from the curriculum, there is just one line on each of these. A no fault divorce says that a GP may be removed without cause provided that a super majority generally above 75% of LPs approve the removal. The flavor here is clearly corporate governance. So the point being that while the concept here is similar to corporate governance for a corporation, but the context is a little bit different because you have fewer investors, fewer LPs, but they are much more savvy. And it is relatively easy to align the interests of LPs with GPs. Next point is removal for cause. Removal for cause is a clause that allows either a removal of the GP or an earlier termination of the fund for a cause. Such a cause may include gross negligence of the GP and so on. So again, this is something that protects the LPs. Investment restrictions. So there might be certain restrictions on the sorts of investments. And the final point is co-investment where if the GP starts a new fund, then the LP has the right to invest in the new fund along with the GP. All right, moving along, I now want you to read example three. And in this example also, we are not required to do anything, but the concept covered is important. Let's go over this together now. and. We look at several scenarios related to distribution waterfalls. Suppose a private equity fund has a committed capital totaling 300 million and a carried interest of 20%. After a first investment of 30 million, the fund exits the investment nine months later with a 15 million profit. Under the deal by deal method, the GP would be entitled to 20% of the deal profit. In other words, 3 million. So the profit was 15 million. The GP gets 20%. Here we are not given a hurdle rate. So we ignore the hurdle rate. In the first alternative of the total return method, the entire proceeds of the sale, 45 million, are entitled to the LP and nothing yet to the GP. As in the point being that carried interest only kicks in after the entire committed capital has been returned, which has not happened. So GP gets no carried interest yet. In the second alternative, this is the second alternative of the total return method. The exit value of 45 million exceeds by more than 20% the invested capital of 30 million. The GP would thus be entitled to 3 million. This is an important point because here we are comparing with the invested amount. Invested amount was 30. The amount returned exceeds the invested amount. So the GP gets carried interest.
continuing the above example with a clawback provision with an annual true up annual true up means that at the end of every year we do a reconciliation and the moment we have a clawback provision that means we are talking about deal by deal suppose that the deal by deal method applies and that a second investment of 25 million is concluded with a loss of 5 million one year later so notice with a deal by deal based on the first deal mentioned up here the gp already has carried interest of 3 million but now does the gp need to give some of this back the answer is yes so let's look at what happens therefore at the annual true up this is the reconciliation at the end of the year the gp would have to pay back 1 million to lps in practice an escrow account is used to regulate these fluctuations until termination of the fund the way you can look at this is how much total investment has been made the lp invested 30 and then again invested 25 so how much is the total investment 55 and what is the total return the total return initially the profit was 15 so 30 became 45 and 25 had a loss of this so 45 plus 20 so total return is this now the carried interest should really be calculated based on this profit amount that is returned is 45 plus 20 which is 65 when you do the calculation the carried interest should be 2 million but the gp has already gotten 3 million so the clawback amount will be 1 million we now come to section 3.2 risks and costs of investing in private equity and what i'll do is here i'll share at a high level the most important and testable risks and costs and then the next two slides give the laundry list of risks and the long list of costs when you invest in a private equity fund what are the risks that you need to be aware of a big one is illiquidity of investments and this is something that you see across many different types of alternative investments as you saw with real estate also here in private equity when you invest you can't 3 days later say you want your money back because the lp puts money in the private equity fund and then the private equity fund is actually buying a company or a part of a company and then the return comes back several years later so you are in this for the relatively long term uncoated investments the underlying investments so these are the portfolio companies where the gp is investing those are not public companies so they are uncoated which means that there are issues with valuation there is a tremendous amount of subjectivity that goes into valuation and then also the fees that are being paid especially the carried interest is often based on valuation so a related item is how do you do the valuation of these investments it's it's not easy requires a fair amount of subjectivity the amount of data available is also often quite limited with these underlying portfolio companies competition for attractive investment opportunities the competition might be high in other words the number of attractive portfolio companies to invest in might be low and the risk then is that for the few attractive options that do exist the gp might end up paying too much if the gp ends up paying too much then obviously the return to the gp and then the return to the lp will be relatively low coming now to costs again as with many other alternative investments the costs are high costs associated with private equity investing are substantially more relative to public market investing what are the major components the transaction fees are relatively high the setup 
of this entire private equity fund, this is a vehicle for investing in the actual companies. Obviously, there is a cost associated with setting up this vehicle. So that impacts the LPs, the management fees and performance fees that need to be paid to the GP. These tend to be relatively high. So for all these reasons, the relative cost of investing in private equity is high. Now this slide gives the laundry list of private equity risk factors. So you can pause the video and read through this. This has been taken from the curriculum. On the previous slide, I gave a summary of what I think are the most important risks. And then this is the long list of costs associated with private equity investing. So again, you can pause and read through this. Next point related to due diligence. In general, due diligence is important, but with private equity, it is particularly important for the following reasons. Private equity funds tend to exhibit a strong persistence of returns over time. This means that top performing funds tend to continue to outperform and poor performing funds also tend to continue to perform poorly. So this is actually quite different from stock market based mutual funds where the persistence of returns is relatively low. Here there is a lot of skill involved in running a good private equity fund. So you as an LP need to find the good funds and by good funds typically we mean good GPs who have the right connections and the right experience and the ability to manage the investments well. The second point is that the performance range between funds is extremely large. For example, the difference between top quartile and third quartile fund IRRs can be about 20 percentage points. This just emphasizes the fact that if you end up investing in a fund that is not good, then your returns will be very poor. And number three, liquidity in private equity is typically very limited and thus LPs are locked for the long term and this connects with what we saw earlier. You are putting in your money and then it's stuck for at least a few years. So you need to do your due diligence and make sure you are putting money in the right place. So this is actually the main point. The second statement here is a side remark. On the other hand, when private equity funds exit an investment, they return the cash to the investor immediately. Therefore, the duration of an investment in private equity is typically shorter than the maximum life of the fund. And this is something I've alluded to earlier and you have seen through examples. Typically, the life of the fund is roughly 10 years, but the duration of a particular investment might be three years or four years because once an investment is exited, then the private equity fund doesn't sit on that money. The money is returned to the LP. Section 3.4 deals with private equity fund valuation. The value of a fund is typically based on NAV, net asset value, and this concept keeps coming over and over. The fund's assets are valued by GPs in several ways, and these are examples of how the fund's assets can be valued. We are not going to go into details because this content has been covered in earlier readings, but I'll just go over this at a high level, which is what the curriculum also does. One way of valuing assets is to value at cost and then make adjustments for any subsequent financing events or deterioration. Another is lower of cost or market value. So this is a classic FRA concept. By revaluation of a portfolio company, whenever a new financing round involving the new investors takes place, the point here is that a private equity fund might invest in a company. Every time there is a new investment, this company has to be valued again because for the new investor, we need to determine what his contribution is relative to the overall value so we can determine the fractional ownership. And to do that, the subject company or the portfolio company needs to be revalued. Once a revaluation happens, then we can use that value in our calculations. At cost with no interim adjustments until the exit. And notice that 
all these are different ways of coming up with the cost. The prospectus of a private equity fund needs to make clear how it is doing these valuations. With a discount for restricted securities, this is something that we saw in a reading from equity where we talked about private company valuation. When investing in a private company, there will be discounts associated with lack of marketability and so on. So those might apply over here. And this is rare, but mark to market by reference to a peer group of public comparable companies and then applying illiquidity discounts. And again, this is something we've talked about earlier. Now we talk about evaluating fund performance. And there are multiple perspectives over here or multiple metrics that you need to be aware of. And I think from a testability perspective, this is quite important. Generally, performance is measured in the private equity fund industry using IRR, internal rate of return. Here you are looking at a gross IRR and a net IRR. So understand the difference. This is the private equity fund. The private equity fund invests in portfolio companies. So there is a certain return involved here because the private equity fund is putting in money and then it gets back money. So the IRR over here between the private equity fund or the private equity company and these investments, this is called the gross IRR. And then you have the limited partners who invest in private equity and then get money back net of management fee and so on. So this is the net IRR. If you want to evaluate how good a private equity firm is at making these investments, managing investments and then exiting at the right time, then you will look at the gross IRR. If you are looking at a LP perspective and the bottom line in terms of how much you are contributing and how much you are getting back, then you will look at the net IRR. Now some other important terms. PIC, this is the ratio of paid in capital divided by the committed capital. Okay, the point being that if you committed 10 million and you actually have paid in 6 million so far, this is a measure of how much of that committed amount you've actually contributed. In my example, that would be 0.6 or 60%. Then DPI, distributed to paid in. Cumulative distributions paid to LPs as a proportion of the cumulative invested capital. DPI is presented net of management fees and carried interest. So what does this mean? Let's say that you are looking here at the cumulative distribution. So this is how much money is paid by the fund to the LP divided by the invested capital. So if so far the LP has invested 100 million and the amount that has been returned is 70 million, then the DPI is 0.7. RVPI is residual value to paid in. Now, you as an investor have contributed 100 million, let's say. 70 million has been returned to you. So this is accounted for in the DPI. But the private equity fund has made investments in portfolio companies. And those portfolio companies have a value of 80 million. You can think of this as the unrealized value of the investments because it's your money as an LP which has been put into portfolio companies. Those portfolio companies have a certain value, but that value has not been realized yet. It is estimated at 80 million using one of the techniques that we talked about earlier. So this is called residual value to paid in. In my simplistic example, the residual value to paid in will be 0. Eight. And then total value to paid in is simply the sum of these two. It's the combination of 
the amount that has been distributed and I hope you are very clear about the term distributed. Distributed means it has been distributed by the private equity firm to the LP. So total value to paid in is the sum of what has been distributed i.e. the realized amount plus the residual value which is the unrealized amount. Let's look at another example and again you don't need to work through this you just need to read it and understand it. Suppose that a private equity fund has a DPI of 0.07. This means distributed to paid in. So for every dollar that you as an LP have contributed, you've only gotten 7 cents back. RV to PI is 0.62. So this means that for every dollar contributed you are in a loss because even the combination of these two is less than one dollar. And this is after five years which actually is not looking very good. The IRR is minus 17 percent. It's clear that the IRR is negative because what was your contribution? Let's say it was one dollar and what you have explicitly gotten back is only seven cents. The value of the investment that has not been returned to you is 0.62. Collectively that is still less than a dollar so the IRR is negative. The fund follows a venture capital strategy in high technology, has a vintage year of 1999. So I alluded to this earlier. In 2000 there was a huge technology burst. So the technology bubble burst. So looks like this vintage year has something to do with why the returns are not good. The term is 10 years. A DPI of 7% indicates that few successful exits were made. A RVPI of 62% points to an extended J curve effect. So in our J curve, you know, we have a very extended J curve. Hopefully eventually it will come up, but things are not looking too rosy right now. The total value to paid in amounts to 69%. And then you can read through the rest, but it is pointing towards what I have already mentioned. 